the, uh, the head of Slate, I think, is, I think he runs it, uh, Jacob Weisberg, I think he's, he's, he, he runs it. He had an article the other day saying, among other things, you know what really disturbs me about the state of public opinion right now is that some people are really urging their fellow Americans, in effect, to thumb their noses at the experts. <laughs> oh, I have no idea why. <laughs> Gee, wh where would that come from? I mean, I guess we forgot what our role in this society is. It's just to sit back and be told by Jacob Weisberg or the New York Times or Chris Matthews or Keith Olbermann or Bill O'Reilly or whatever. Just sit and be told which people we're supposed to listen to and what we're supposed to believe. Well, people are actually breaking out of this and saying, you know what? I did listen to those people and that's why I lost half my portfolio. So I'm a little curious to get another kind of point of view here. So the Austrian school then uh, had probably its uh, first great renaissance in modern times in 1974, because F.A. Hayek won the Nobel Prize for answering the question, why does the economy seem to be subject to these booms and busts? Why does this seem to happen? He wins the Nobel Prize for this. Now, I realize that, you know, as we learned a couple years ago, they're, they're kind of handing out Nobel Prizes like candy. <laughs> But in, in defense of F.A. Hayek, let's understand why it matters that Hayek wins it. Hayek wins it for saying the opposite of what the Nobel Committee wants to hear. So that is kind of an achievement. It's, it's one thing to, you know, just say the standard old thing and then, and then you win. Well, surprise, surprise. But the year before Hayek won that prize, 1973, was the year that Ludwig von Mises died. I just want to say a quick thing about him. Now, Ludwig von Mises, uh, born in 1881, had a, had a long, long productive life. Uh, spent much of his life in Austria and then in, on the European continent uh, in general, because he, he was in Switzerland for a while teaching. And he wrote, an, I mean, and I've heard it argued that Mises deserved to win the Nobel Prize five times over for the originality of his contributions. And in fact, when Hayek won it in 1974, he's winning it basically for elaborating on a theory that Mises himself developed. Well, as the 1930s wear on, I mean, imagine yourself being a Jewish economics professor in Europe in the 1930s, and you're teaching about international cooperation in the form of the free market economy, and that we don't need each country to be self-sufficient. We need an international division of labor. Well, there's a, there's a political party in Europe that's not really, you know, favorable to that, that kind of outlook. So, so Mises had to leave Europe. Uh, he, he just finally decided his friends were urging him, uh, it's not looking good here. I mean, this is the political environment is terrible. So, in fact, the Nazis confiscated his books and papers, so his, his library was ransacked, and his papers were only rediscovered about 20 years ago. Uh, he and his wife fled to the United States in 1940, almost empty-handed, and at that point he was 59 years old. So you think, well, I guess that's it for this guy. I mean, that's it. His life is over. He gets to the United States, can't find a paid university position in an economics department. Even though, I mean, these days, he's looked to as a prophet. Uh, generations of students are now looking to him and studying from him and being inspired by professors influenced by him. But at that time, well, you know, every, you know, sort of quasi-Marxist on earth was, was actually getting prestigious posts in the U.S. But a guy like Mises, the best he could get was an unpaid university post at NYU. And a group of businessmen paid his salary, and he uncomplainingly held his seminars and continued to write and refused to give ground. And in fact, he had the most productive phase of his whole life. He produced uh, three books in the 1940s in the U.S., Bureaucracy, Omnipotent Government, Omnipotent Government being largely a, book, a history book about the Nazis, and uh, Human Action, his great treatise in 1949. Yale University Press publishes his great treatise, Human Action, 1949. It becomes an academic bestseller. It's 900 pages. When at the Mises Institute, we announced a few months ago that we, f we had a brand new edition of Human Action, but we found in our warehouse uh, some remain like 100 remaining copies of the old edition, and we were going to sell it for like 15 bucks, if you just, whoever wants to get it. The website was, sh had, was shut down by people. I mean, people, if, if this had been a physical store, people would have been crushed in the mayhem to get copies of a 900-page treatise. Now, how many schools of economic thought can say that today? That people are, are, are clawing over their own grandmother to get copies of these books. So what is it? What is so compelling about this? Well, I'm going to try and answer that question by talking specifically about what the school contributes to our understanding of this 
aspect of the economy, the boom-bust cycle. This is called the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Now this is, uh, again, this, is, this, this may sound technical. If I say Austrian theory of the business cycle, this is not technical. Anybody can understand this. I am convinced that the only people who have trouble understanding this, unfortunately, are other Nobel Prize winners. Other than that, this is, this is not hard. The theory begins with a question. And this is the question we should be asking. Why? Why? Why does the economy do this? And it's no answer to say, well, that's just the way capitalism is. I'm sorry that does not count as an answer. That is a cop-out. That's not an answer. That is sort of the Marxian answer. Well, capitalism does this. All right, well, I, I think I want a little more, more than that. Uh, then there are psychological explanations. Well, investors become overwhelmed by animal spirits that, that make them hold back from investing, and this pulls things down. So there's no, there's, uh, in that explanation, there isn't even any, there's hardly any analysis of the, of the boom. It's just all, well, suddenly there's a bust. And, you know, for whatever reason, it occurs. Well, okay, th these are not entirely satisfying answers. We want an answer that involves real factors, not just psychological ones. So Lionel Robbins, who was a great British economist, in 1934 wrote a book called The Great Depression. And he asked in that question, how come every once in a while we see a cluster of error in the economy? Because that's really what we're studying. When we study a business cycle, you know, doing well, then badly, well, then badly. What we're really studying is the phenomenon of error. Why is error being committed? Why are we finding that all of a sudden, all at the same time, entrepreneurs are making the same sorts of mistakes in the same direction? Like, why, why would that happen? That's not obvious. Like, we can understand why one business may go out of business or one industry may be depressed, but why would the whole thing be suffering at once? Like, that's, that is not obvious. We only think it's obvious because we've lived with it in the same way that we think it's obvious that prices just go up all the time. We think that's obvious. No, they don't. They didn't go up uh, through the, the first 150 years of U.S. history. They go up because we have a Federal Reserve that keeps pumping money in. That puts upward pressure on prices. Prices used to decline. But when something goes on long enough, people just figure, well, it's just a feature of reality and there ain't no doing nothing about it. Well, maybe there is if we figure out what's doing it, what is causing it. Why are the errors being committed, particularly when, consider what it takes to be an entrepreneur. In order to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to produce something the general public wants at a price it's willing to pay. So in other words, you have to take inputs, combine them in some way that people want, and bang, give them a consumer good. And if you can't do that, if, if, you, make, if you suffer losses, that's society's way of saying, we just don't want that stuff that you're making. You know, you're, these resources would be better put to other uses. Or if you, if you go out of business, that's society's way of saying, look, you may be a super guy. We're not disputing that. But right now, we can't entrust you with command over society's scarce resources. We've got to give these resources, in effect, into the control of somebody else. So given that entrepreneurs at any given time have been selected by the market, these are the ones who have passed the market test, who have satisfied consumer demand and been rewarded with profits, which is society's way of saying, yes, you are correctly allocating resources, now do more of that. Why would these people above all suddenly be caught making errors? All right, so what is the answer to this question? When we get to the answer to this question, we're gonna, it's going to be like, uh, I don't know what to compare it to, I don't know. It's going to be like some super thing. How about that? Two things we need to do. Now again, now don't, don't you dare go anywhere, because I'm telling you, this is just the only, the only part that is even slightly technical. And then when you see, wait, wait, that was the hardest part? Yeah, I know. That's the hardest part. Here it is, just two little things. First, when the Austrians think about production, like the process of producing something, they think about production as taking time, okay, realistic, and proceeding through a series of stages. And so we refer to production as, as taking place in a structure. There's a structure of production. And what I mean by that is we have higher order stages of production leading to lower order stages. The lowest order stage is the Twinkie that you're holding in your hand. That's probably a bad example of the market process is the, the Twinkie. So, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, let's say a bagel. That's more, sort of more respectable. Uh, so a bagel does not just appear as a bagel. I mean, at first, you know, a farmer has to go through, you know, you have to, you have to grow wheat and you have a harvest. And, and then there's a processing thing. So, so the far, what the farmer's doing is that's the highest stage of production because that's the stage that's the, the, the farthest removed from the finished consumer good, the bagel, that you see in the, the, uh, the deli or the, the bakery. 
the, the, and then the next thing, then it has to go to a processor, and then it just keeps on going, and then, then a, a wholesaler, and then there's a marketing arm to tell people that your bagel is the best one, and then there's retailers and transportation. So it has to go through these stages before finally it's a bagel in your outstretched hand. So that's what we call a structure production, just one stage followed by the other, and each one is farther away in time. Okay, and then the immediate good is the last of the, the lowest of the stages. Okay, so that's the first concept we need to understand, and that's very straightforward. The second concept is, is uh, just involves interest rates. Um, we just want to just, just say something about interest rates, and then we can understand what exactly is going on. When, when the general public saves, this puts downward pressure on interest rates. This is just my sort of this, one of the tidbits of the night. And, and when you think about this, you can see why that would be. When you and I put our money in the bank, the bank now has more to lend. So in effect, the price of borrowing becomes lower. Because there's a greater supply of stuff to lend, so the price of borrowing it becomes lower. The banks have more of it. It's just a supply and demand thing. Second thing about interest rates to know for this all to make sense is that if you were, a, if you were engaged in business and you suddenly saw interest rates go from 15% to 3%, let's say, you would be much more likely to engage in that long-term project that you've been hoping to do, like you know, purchase that new plant or build a new plant or expand your mining capacity or engage in more research and development, things that take a long time. You'd be more likely to do more of these things. And why is that? Because the longer something takes, if you take out a loan for many years, the longer the term of that loan is, the more painful those interest payments are, as I'm sure you've noticed if you have a 30-year mortgage. The first year of that mortgage, you're making those payments and you get the bill and it says, okay, last month you paid uh, $83 in principal and $800 in interest. You're saying, what the freaking heck is this? But if the interest rate came down a few percentage points, even just a few percentage points, you would be making much bigger payments on the principal than you were before. Well, that's basically what, just what I'm driving at, is that the longer the term of the loan, the more burdensome the interest portion of the payment is on you. So that when interest rates come down, well, longer term investment suddenly begins to disproportionately seem more desirable. And these higher order stages of production, like research and development, is a very high order stage. We don't directly consume research and development services. Like, I don't go into a laboratory and say, all right, just put some stuff in some test tubes and I'll just watch. Like, we don't consume it that way. We wait until it bears fruit in a production process for a, an idea for a new product that then has to pass through stages till the end. So research and development is very high order. Raw material extraction, mining, farming, all these things are very high order production. And so these things are most likely to expand when interest rates are, are, are lower, just because it makes more business sense to do it then. Okay, here we go. Now we're ready for the Austrian business cycle. I turned it off by accident. Oh, that, that's, that's good to know, actually. Like if, I, if I somehow just can't resist saying something under my breath, I can just go, and then just put it right back on. <laughs> that's good to know. All right, so now, here we go. Why is it good for society that businesses engage in their long-term investment projects at a time when interest rates are low? Why is it not just good for them that they invest when interest rates are low? Why is it good for everybody? 